I am unashamed. What about you? So, Dad, you were telling me you uh, you took a tumble. I see your arms kind of. Sc- oh, did you? Kind of scuffed up there. What, what? That that was caused by large blocks of concrete <laughs> we have on both sides of the dump that we're holding about eighty acres of water this winter. So we we got it all figured out there. But I was down there. I I went down to that on the bank there. It was all rocks piled up there, concrete. Took a track hole and did it. But anyway, I got down there and I was peeked up in that pipe to look on the other end, <laughs> make sure the beavers wasn't trying to stop me up up in that pipe. But uh, on the way out of that, I slipped. And fortunately for me, no one was there to see me fall. <laughs> I did a crawl. Why, why are we like that? That's the first thing you did. That's the first thing you did was look up, see if Dan saw. I looked saw. around to see if, see if old Dan, he was with me. I looked around, he wasn't there. I said, Whoo, I'm glad he didn't see that. Because <laughs> he'd have been saying, Man, are you all right? Oh, I did it last night. So I'm in there, Woo. you know, in my little lair. And Missy said, I think a tree just fell on the house. Of course, it's the same house I'm in. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> You were in so, your little man cave. Yeah, here. I said, so if a tree falls on your house and nobody hears it, did it fall? <laughs> so you're quite she the went, philosopher. So you, guess what she said? Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> so it's pouring down rain. So I thought, well, I guess I need to go investigate it, you know. So I walked outside. But those, you know, my little deck where my dog stays up under, it, it can get slippery. And I was just walking. I mean, it wasn't like I ran down the stairs or. You weren't I, alarmed. I just remember on the first step down, I just, because then I, you know, yeah. next thing you know, I'm going end over end. But I don't have any, I mean, I looked, but I looked around. You know, it's pretty dark out there. I had a flashlight. I bled slightly. <laughs> I bled a little bit, but. Uh... In the grand scheme of things, no problem. I said, I'm getting like that woman of mine. Just one. Well, yeah, I was supposed to say, you know who was the happiest this morning about Dad's fall? Mom. Yeah, she oh, yeah, she, she was, was like, see, I'm not the only one that has, that well, falls I, around here. So I came back inside to finish my story because I see no tree. And now I'm mad because I, I fell. And, and you're I'm wet. wet. And I'm wet. And, of course, and she said, well, you didn't have to go out there and look. I said, excuse me. That's, that's your response to this. <laughs> well, we have the concrete where the where the where the rigs are parked. That concrete, it's been raining on it every week, and it's developed kind of a little look like a, a little, little scum. green green scum mm. that's growing up. Yeah, that's out what that happened. That's where you better deck, watch it. Look. And I mean, I walked <laughs> out this morning. It was like I said, boy, this this baby is slick. We didn't oh, collaborate boy. on this story, but when I went down this morning to feed my dog. I wanted to investigate what happened with my fall, and that green scum That's was right. on them boards. And I thought, huh. And then guess what? Then I looked up, and a, that a tree had fallen, but it had fallen from my neighbors. I have a little gazebo down there at the pine, and it missed that. I mean, a bull of a pine. It missed it by a foot. And fell on my neighbors. Surprised that them big pines are falling like that. Cause they're not. They're not bad about falling like that. These have a better That's root the third system. Third one in the same area. Yeah. But I've noticed they do it every time there's a big rain, because that that water starts coming. Somebody built my house back in the day, right where all the rain goes. <laughs> yep. <That's some laughs> so one people. day, look, I'm gonna be sitting there. And it ain't gonna be a tree fa- tree <laughs> fell. I'm gonna hear the house fell in the pond because <laughs> I think that's what's gonna. I've it's just gonna slide it. right in. We're just gonna slide like California. We're just gonna slide off. Into I the cut pond. a few of those at the house, but they're virgin pine. They, I'd say, they were there during Thomas Jefferson's reign as president, about 1800. They were there because they, these things are old, but they are unbelievably tall and some of them lean in my way over on the I looked at that well so I think I, I gave the lumber that I got from that to Burley and he built his cat whole cabin with it yeah I mean, it was virgin pine and I mean you could get like about 
Four oh, they're cuts. They're over hundred. You even get to the limbs. They're a hundred feet tall. Oh, they're a hundred foot easy. Yeah, this huge is, thing. But is, I do remember when I was a kid. Remember me by that? What after, after I'm gone? Just say, they wonder why you never cut them big old trees. I just they're too pretty to cut. But I did cut about two of them or three of them. I well, gave Burl the lumber. He built a whole cabin out of it. it I just remember when I was a kid, the lightning strikes on them big old trees. I mean, it, oh, yeah. I bet. Ten of them got struck in my childhood. One of them had killed just standing there, and I climbed it like an idiot. I had a bell, got me one of these belts and these spurs, and I went up that thing, tied me along. I remember that now. And I had about a 10-foot lane that where it wouldn't tear down, build, build in sheds, porches. So I, I had it one place, but I got me a rope, a long one, and got way out there in my four-wheel drive truck, got a winch line on it, got a little tension on it, started cutting on that thing. I remember the one that and happened. Directly when that thing came down, I mean, it it went down the only place without it ripping something apart, but it was close. <laughs> I remember Ooh. I remember our, the whole family was outside on the other side watching the whole process to see if you, you got killed or if we smashed yeah, a house. You know, my woman ran out there, get out of that tree, don't try it. <laughs> You know, you know, you're you going way too high. I just kept going up. That way, I knew I had a yeah. pull on it. Yeah, I don't just know. like that. In the last podcast, I would the, pay that the, to have that done now. But I mean, <laughs> well, I time, would hope at so. At the time, the, I didn't have any money. In the last part. podcast in the overtime, I showed y'all a a picture of a dog's skull stuck in a tree, and they had, yep. they did some research. He had followed a coon up into the tree. That picture he, is something. He couldn't turn around and go back. It was like, a hoop. It's like going in a hoop They net. built that lake, what, 25, 30 years ago? 40 years ago? What's the lake? That lake you're talking about. No, this wasn't in the lake. That was that was that was in that, that Arizona was, and uh, Nevada the, where you're talking about, the lakes. That, that well, was two different lake, stories. Yeah, the water, that was two different stories. But I just thought, you know, there's a, there's a thought that seems right to a man or a dog, and in the end it leads to death. <laughs> Yeah, it's a reminder. Don't go up a hollow tree without an exit strategy. Well, he may have got in there, and that coon may have done him in. He probably or got you will be wedged f- up in there, couldn't get yeah. out. But it was just when they cut the tree, there was just a skull looking at him. That thing in Kentucky, when the Kentucky River got way up, it, it's it's hilly and there, rocky, you know. And there was a cave down there, and the water came up so quick. It flooded that cave, you know, and it just started coming in from the river. Well, this dog got over in there, was washed downstream, and got in the cave. The water kept rising, filled the hole up at the cave. The dog just kept going back, back further and further to get out of the water. And two months later, when the water fell off, you came out. That dog come, yeah. <laughs> Good night. There's a dog looking at us. So that was the dog him out of there, but he went two months in a cave without yeah, any right. food. He had water. That was but he the, was a pitiful looking man. I that bet was, he was the local. That was the local dog version of Noah's Ark. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> the dog lived to tell about it. I mean, he made it, but I mean, he was stuck in that cave for man. two months. Well, another no story. Food. I, I want to maybe wanna, he ate some bugs or something. I want to put an exclamation point on. So this weekend, you no, know, I, I told the story about me losing my golf bag and all that. Yep. The just your mistreatment chaos of, of, by the airline sued about that. So about a week later, because during that process of trying to locate the bag and use technology, because one of the representatives had had lied to me saying that they would call me. You remember the story? Yep. No call. I'm still waiting on a call. Never heard back from them. I get a memo on my phone. Ding. And so when the, when my wife downloaded the app for the airline on my phone, they sent me a message. And I thought, okay. Now what? Because I'm not flying out anytime soon. I thought, I think they're going to issue me an apology. <laughs> That's what I thought. So I clicked on it. The message, you know what it said? Your bag has arrived. <laughs> A day I've late. Had the, no, they ain't a day late. They a week late. <laughs> you are because you, you had already lost get down your there. bag up to that point. I'd lost the bag and retrieved it, and maybe that's why she said you need to fill out this form. 
because they thought they still. Uh, I'm not filling out. I'm not giving you twenty dollars, and I'm not filling out the form. And, I'm get, and I may never come back again. I may take a boat or a train <laughs> next time. But I just thought I would uh, put a bow on that story. So instead of instead of getting the apology you deserved, instead you got a we we're still incompetent. <laughs> It was 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> there was no charge. They just said, it's here. And I, yeah, that was a bad That was a way for me to respond. I would have said, no, it's not. I got it. <laughs> I stole it. I stole my own bag. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought you'd find that humorous. It's pretty humorous. I do find that humorous. All right. So, Dad, you had watched yourself out there. I did tell Mom, who was like Job's friends, rejoicing in your calamity, that you bounce back pretty quick, though. Yep. Unlike hers, who's usually a trip to the wound that is, care. That is correct. You know, so you you did bounce back from your injury, so which is which is all good. So let's get back to Hebrews uh, chapter eleven, and I guess all this talk about water is perfect because it takes us back. We, we talked about Moses last time, kind of introduced him in the text, although we had been mentioning him all along. There were a couple of little factoids I wanted to tell you about him before we moved on to this this uh, Red Sea crossing. You know, Moses. He wrote, um, he wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So, you know, the Torah, he wrote it. So it's, it's not like, it's pretty prolific that he was the guy that wrote what is established the, the law for the Jews, you know, for all those thousands of years. Yep. Another one, Dad, is he wrote that Psalm 90 which you quote a lot that Peter quotes as well about the, the idea about we're like grass and that's how life is. And in that Psalm 90, he mentions that that's, you have 70 years on the earth, 80 if you're strong. And I thought that was pretty amazing. A guy that ancient had that kind of insight, you know, into what now we all know to be true, which is pretty much and how he, he, And he probably, I don't know whether it's a psalmist, whether Moses wrote the part about, you know, the, the pandemics will come and go, but you know, they won't, the God will protect you from them. But he was saying, look, pandemics are a part of, God's the rest. Right, right. It's all part of the process. Well, he gave you a nice I looked look. around, and every time I look up, you know, m- monkey pox and then, you know, <laughs> COVID coming from it's, bats. It's something. You know, coming out of monkeys and bats, and it's killing people. You know, it's, it's, a, oh, it's a bone to be too. Pandemics are real. Well, you got your three-point sermon here, Al. Good. I always 24, like it. Well, he, I mean, I, I really, I really like it. He, you know, in 25... He chose mistreatment along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Yeah. So there's point one. Right. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ of greater value than the treasures of Egypt Mm because he was looking ahead to his reward. There's number two. And then he focused on the invisible. He persevered because he saw him. He was invisible. He was invisible. I like that. That's good. I mean, I may have to preach does that. that. Does that not apply to what we're going? I mean, when you go back as a young person, because it's more important for them to be liked and have friends Yep. than to anything else, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what it comes down to. If you're going to, if you're going to decide to put God first in your life, you're going to be mistreated. Yeah, and by he, your he just friends. wrote, as a matter of fact, in the book of Genesis, God said, "This is Moses talking." Uh, by the way, God said, "Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to to mark seasons and days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth." And it was so. God made two great lights, uh, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the I mean, some guy is sitting under a tree <laughs> just scratching this out on a, on a piece of paper, Yeah, and it gets to us. Yeah, the creation narrative. Yeah. So <laughs> You know, like, what, some kind of world traveler, some kind of <laughs> geologist, some kind of cosmologist? I mean, just this guy. guy. Just a guy who grew up in the house of Pharaoh and ah. spent 40 years in the desert. Let's, let's take a break. Yeah. 
No, that's an excellent point, Dad. And a lot of people have asked this. Well, when oh, did, what a resume that dude has. When did Moses, you know, get all this information? Well, you remember, yeah. you remember when Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 3, he talked about the glowing effect of Moses. Yeah. Moses would go out in a tent and the presence of God, whatever that means, would descend on the tent. And he was having a conversation with the Almighty. And some of that conversation said, by the way, you need to write about the sun and the moon that I put up there. So make sure you put that in there on, that, on, the, on the beginning there. Right. Now, you just think about it. But you know what's interesting, Dad? So what happens is most people aren't aware of this. If you go back and read the account. I, mean, I don't think he'd ever been to college, had he? Well, he, he did grow up in the house of Pharaoh, which would have meant that he was trained everything they knew up at the, until that time. So he yep. did have some knowledge. But whenever God was having this conversation with him in the tent of meeting, you know who was in there as well? His scribe, Joshua, who was the next in line. He was in there writing all this down. So the, all this stuff in the Torah, everything from Genesis that you talked about, the creation of the world, oh. the first sin, the Garden of Eden, you know, the Tower of Babel, all that amazing stuff. People are still arguing about it. They still are. And that all came to him when he was in those little confabs with the Almighty, and Joshua was writing it all down, which was... You know, it makes sense to me. Yeah, which I mean, if the sun is that burnt. has something to do with you know God had to train him to what he what he had to write down. Right, but he was speaking through a, a human being, and and you say well, which one he picks it? Old Moses. Moses is the one that wrote all this down. Wow. You know, on the creation and all, everybody living. <laughs> you know, uh, and it's exactly the I mean, uh, it, it, to have made it up. I mean, the need for light. Huh. I mean, think about what the sun and the moon does, and it's a we've now proven that it's a burning ball of fire so you think well who started it if you have a fire it had to start yeah right has it always been burning when well, and look not only that the, the just 13.5 billion years yeah but it hadn't always when somebody's, somebody's talking started. to me <laughs> they tell me they know what happened 13 billion 500 million years ago Here's what happened. Somebody tells me that he's lying, <laughs> <laughs> or I mean, he's just okay. Or he's, well, he's, he's, years ago. Or he's just guessing, Dad. He yeah. may not be lying. He's Man, just here's guessing. what happened: thirteen point five, not thirteen billion, and just leave it at that. No, thirteen billion five hundred million. Got to get that five hundred million. Put that little point in there. It sounds like you really know. Well, that's all I'm saying. Is who started the fire? <laughs> that's a, they should have. That's a uh, Billy Joel song. And then who's, who started the fire? Man, Just before there was something, what was there? Did they say nothing? And I'm like, so nothing explodes and makes something? I said, I'm not, I don't believe that. No, I agree. That's I why that, when people read it and they say, well, this is ridiculous. I'm like, well, what, what's your, well, enlighten me. Yeah. Hey, and if you, uh, what, what is your, what's your and, and I've said this before, but if you want to look now, you can actually look now. You need to tell Dan to pull it up on his phone sometime or his computer and show you the James Webb telescope. They sent the thing out to the sun. Yeah. It's orbiting the sun. It's a hundred times more powerful than the one they sent up here, the Hubble. Mm -hmm. And it's just incredible. You're, you're, you're looking at galaxies, the formation of, I mean, cause what happens is it takes so long for that to get out and back to us. Yeah. We're, we're literally looking back in time, which is yeah. pretty amazing, but you're able to see that. And, uh, and Moses said it in one verse, God created the heavens and the earth. One verse describes us looking and seeing galaxies yep. being formed. I mean, and he was just, qualified to pontificate on that because he had a conversation with God via a burning bush that that's, wouldn't burn up. That's right. Yeah. That's why I was making that reference to the sun. It, it's because the sun is still burning and burning. And I, you know, I, I can see how his mind was thinking, but he know he knows who started it. That's right. Is my point. Well, that was interesting. You're right that I didn't think about that. It was actually the fire in the bush was the same well, right. situation. But you know what also happened there, Jace, when he asked him, he said, who are you, Lord? And he was, and it was the first time we get the I am. I am the Lord, your God. And again, we talk about shadows. Remember when Jesus comes along? And he's well, he like, introduced that I am who I am. Right. Which is later on when Jesus got here, would use that, what, eight times, seven, eight times? And uh, as that, a, that was Jesus's nickname. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah, I am that I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. I mean, it's the ultimate mic drop statement. All right, I want to read this uh, verse, this next verse in 28, because uh, you mentioned it last time on the podcast. What chapter are you in? Uh, Hebrews 11. 
Yep. We've been mentioning this verse for weeks. I know. We're finally going to mention it in context. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. So there's another shadow is the concept of... We'll go the, through that real quick. What was so? So you remember they had the plagues, ten, ten, plague. ten plagues, and they were trying to get Pharaoh to let the people leave Israel. There was a famous statement in there when he said, "Okay, you know, in that negotiation, he's like, we'll lift this these plagues." Remember with the frogs because yeah. the frogs always intrigue me because frogs are so good. <laughs> But if you got that many of them, unless, unless they you, outnumber you well, in your yeah, house. Yeah. Okay, wait a minute here. But for yeah, I a think while, it was more boy, than just supper frog legs. <laughs> well, yeah, I think too many you know, frogs. They took the house. For a minute, it was like, oh, it's kind of <laughs> like that time when you said, "Let's get into the crawfish business." Yeah. For the first week, I thought, "Boy, this is awesome. <laughs> I am, I am doing what I love to do." And then after that, it and became, then when the blood poison it set became in. a plague of <laughs> hospital visits. <laughs> Well, Dead I got animals. to a point to where I said I will never eat another crawfish <laughs> the rest of my life. It really does when you get on the on the work side of that business. Yeah, that's you right. think you know everything you, people go through to get crawfish to you. Everything's going through the digestive system of a crawfish because they'll mm-hmm. eat you. If you oh, were to fall in you. the trap, they would eat you, Joe. If your finger, if you had a fall and and lost one of your fingers, which is now a possibility at this stage of our lives. I mean, me and you can't even stand up. Yeah. <laughs> and your finger gets a d- detached from your body and falls into any <laughs> creek or pond here. Look, it literally will be gone in seconds. That is They correct. just... <laughs> <laughs> yep. Everything, everything so, here wants to I've eat I've always you. said you tie a man in the water and tie him tight on a tree out there where all them crawfish are. You go up there the next morning, however far that water was, no meat. Pick clean. Pick clean. So what I was going to make reference to, though, Al, is when, when they asked Pharaoh, you know that uh, well, Jeff Wallen, one of our buddies, he's a great preacher. He, I heard a sermon when I was a teenager, never forgot it. The name of it was One More Night with <laughs> <Yeah>. the Frogs. Because <laughs> they, they offered relief to the plague, and he said, just give me one more night. One I mean, more. it's like, and the point was, I'm not surrendering. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'd I'm. rather try to figure out how I'm going to do this myself than relent, you know. And it, it, was, a, it was a very, very good sign. So it, <clears throat> that's what happened to Pharaoh. The, the severity of the plagues got worse. And by the time we get to the – because he kept saying, okay, I'm going to let you go. And then he'd go back on his word. He gets to the 10th one, and the 10th one broke his back because every firstborn – person or animal in the whole country dropped dead in one night. I mean, you talk, I mean, just think about the, the, the pain of that. So, so God devised a plan to take a lamb, every family in the Israel, they had their camp, you know, where, and there's, you know, millions of them. And they would put the blood of this lamb on the doorpost and the, the just angel destroyer that came through that night and killed all the Egyptians and all their animals, Nobody from Israel died. None of their livestock, none of them. And so that is the concept that then Jesus refers to several times is the Passover lamb, which that was he a is. a tough, tough pandemic. Now that would be a rough one. One night, Ooh, I would be so gone. Nice. You know, Anna would be gone. You know, my dog would be gone. I mean, just all the firstborn, you know, which would have been shocking. So that's oh. what he's talking about with that idea of the sprinkling of blood and that's the kind of the first time we see it in relationship to jesus and the concept of the lamb let's take a break i was just going to clarify where i saw that so that's exodus 8 on the story i was saying you know he predicted 8 3 the nile will team team with frogs they will come up into your palace and in your bedroom and under your bed and in the houses Verse 4, the frogs will go up on you and your people and all your officials. And the Lord said to Moses, "Uh, stretch out your hand, staff, and canal, and and make the frogs come up. So they come up. So then they get in the conversation in verse 9. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you 
and your officials and your people that you and your house may be rid of the frogs except for those that remain in the Nile, which is where they belong. And then the next verse, verse 10, tomorrow. <laughs> he wanted one more night with the frog. <laughs> which is an awesome sermon. Want, yeah, it really is. I, I didn't want to just tell part of the story and leave it. but No, it's good. And and so this this they left. Well, what was interesting was I said it broke Pharaoh's back. It did for a, for a minute. But as soon as Israel leaves, they leave Egypt, they go down, they're in the desert, they're heading for the land that God had promised Abraham 400 years earlier. And as soon as they get out of there, Pharaoh has a change of heart because now he feels burned because he lost them. And so he sends his army to track them down. And remember, they're not, this is, they've been in slavery. It's not like they're armed or anything. They're just going out through the desert and it's millions of them. Mm -hmm. So, it's, I mean, they're pretty much just easy pickings for uh, the biggest army in the world at the time. And they come up against the Red Sea. They get there and how, how we, what are we going to do here? And so Moses puts his staff in the water. And of course, God parts it literally and had a big old wind comes in and blows and even dries it out for them. And then all those people march through that water. And you know, of course the old 10 commandments movie, you know, you can't remember the old look where the water standing up on both sides. And then the army comes in after them just about the time they're clearing the red sea. And then God just collapses the walls onto this army. And so the greatest army on earth has just been literally drowned. Which, by the way, this weakened them to the point that then they were susceptible. You go back historic and look after this happened to Egypt. People kept coming in from all around there and taking over, which when we get to Exodus 1 and Joseph, the new kings, the reason you have them is because they didn't have an army anymore. God had drowned them all. So this, this just shows you, though, how people are so defiant to God, though. I mean, you think about that 10 plague story and what it led to. I mean, we know the story, so it loses its shock and all right but i mean what's it going to take for you to realize that you don't want to be on the wrong side of god almighty that's right you know but just in our minds especially people in power they just have a real problem surrendering but it's not unlike us having to surrender in our daily lives i mean it's just, just this battle between what we want to do and our agenda and trusting in god is really the battle of life. And it also shows, that's a good point, it also shows you once your heart is embittered, which obviously Pharaoh's was, I mean, literally, he, he'll he just keep feeding it. I mean, to send his army into that sea, thinking somehow he could pull this out. And already after you had locusts. He's beginning to. He's beginning And, yeah. and, and he's now we're to, killing the firstborn. No, yeah. That's when they said, okay. He's wait. beginning to sound like Joe Biden. <laughs> Well, draw your own conclusions. You know. <laughs> Maybe more coherent. So another thing I thought was interesting, Jason, about this Red Sea thing is remember those statements that Paul made in 1 Corinthians 10 about this being a shadow of baptism because they were in, they were in between the walls of water and there was the cloud that had been going around over them this whole time to keep them from burning up in the desert. And he said just like they were encompassed in water, Paul compared that to the to the baptism you know, that's how that was their coming out of Egypt, finally coming out of slavery for good and coming into newness. Yeah. And I thought it was a really interesting. <clears throat> that's again that you get an insight. You have individuals running around and they, they just passed a bill. We're going <laughs> to give you all enough money to save the planet. But they forget in the Hebrews letter in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish. That tells the people that's saying, no, we're going to save it. Uh, they're going to perish, but you remain, Lord. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will cha be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. What he said is, you're not going to destroy the planet. I am. Yeah. And they're like, wait, wait, wait. And they're going to they're gonna somehow jump in here and save what God said he's going to destroy. Lower the temperature. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to pull it off. No, they're not. Well, but he also gave us, you know, from the flood and Noah, the rainbow, which is a guarantee that he would also give us grace, which eventually led to Jesus. I mean, if you if you don't make it in the end, it wasn't that he didn't try. I mean, God provided a way for you. Yep. You know, in Jesus. Which, by the way, so, you know, 
you see a lot of rainbow flags around now, and we all know what is trying to be presented there. But if you wonder what you should do as a believer, every time I see them, and, and boy, man, on the Pride Month, they were everywhere, the cities I was going to. I said, this is awesome. Look at all the people that are giving God praise for a covenant that he made with man. So every time I see her, that's what I think I of. I think the same thing. It's I'm Genesis like, 9. You didn't invent that. No. That's a God thing. It's a God thing. That's and right. it's it's a it's a complicated yeah. you know was it it's actually uh Sadie was talking about this in her in her sermon. We only see half of it. Right. But if you looked at it from space, it's a complete circle. Right. Which is a never ending covenant that he made. Right. He would And we know it's we know what caused it <clears throat> with the prism of the water, being able to bend the, the light through the water. So I mean it's a it's a fascinating thing. But so I'm just saying you say people say, Well, wait, that's not why they're putting I don't care why what they're saying. I know what it means. Can't so you s- they don't celebrate they don't have original ideas. No. So oh. they took something that I, I like the explanation of what God used it for, yeah. then you just think, oh, here's a rainbow. Let's let's come up with some agenda for us. Celebrate the covenant. God says he's not going to do that again. He said the only now we're waiting for the final stop, which is was which is what comes next. Well your first Corinthians ten reference was pretty I mean, just to read that, yeah, read that. a lot of that might have gone slap over the head here. But he he said in one through four uh, five. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact that our forefathers were all under the cloud, that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They ate spiritual food, drank spiritual drink. So it gives you the picture because you think about it. They just basically had to trust you. You would never like a plan that says, hey, let's go walk <laughs> into the sea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd look around for a boat. I'd say, now what's the plan again? So you how about nervous faith. were the people at the end of the thing that thought, "Are we going to get through here before these walls come down?" I wouldn't have made it because I'd have said, "Y'all, let me know how that." <laughs> I mean, it's just as a of course guy. you had a motivation with that army bearing down on well, you to get on through. I, yeah, I get it. You're trapped, <laughs> Al, but I usually don't say, "Let's just walk across the ocean." <laughs> That's, right. That's exactly right. <laughs> but there had to be some faith and trust. So and, that that and is you know what, Jason, to your point talking about worship. As soon as they got across, you remember they had a big. Big worship and and Miriam wrote a song about it and yeah. I mean the first thing they did was they they gave praise to God which is great. Let's take another break. So so yeah so thanks for reading that because so they get through. Uh, we've talked about Jericho and Rahab and past podcasts, but so that was the the conquering of of Canaan, which was the remember this is all promised this land way back to Abraham. So it's the realization of another promise that, that God had made and all the cities fell. Now they're there. And then he kind of shifts in, in, in verse 32. He's going to kind of just broaden it out. And it says, and what more shall I say? Verse 32. I do not have time to tell about Gideon, uh, Barak or Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. So he mentions the judges, and sometime if you're just up for an interesting read in the Bible, go read the book of Judges because it is it was the I mean, it was the wild, wild west of Israel's history, which is really amazing. And Jay's, you realize that Barack, he he was a he was a military leader. He wasn't really a judge, but his wife was. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or I, I mean, they guessed they were married. Deborah was the one he who did was, something embarrassing, but I can't remember what it was. Do what? He did something embarrassing. Well, he's the one that uh, in the story of, of Barack and Deborah, he had conquered this this guy. They'd come in, they was trying to, you know, and so they went and fought him because Barack was the military leader. And this woman, um, the guy that they were fighting, he hid out in a tent. So he went in there and went to sleep. He was yeah, exhausted. That's what it was. He sent his wife. Yeah. So, right. no. So, the what his what the guy, the wife, the, the, he's in there asleep. She goes in there and she takes a tent peg and just goes right through the temples while he's asleep. 
And then so she goes outside, and so when Barack is coming by, she's like, hey, the guy you're looking for, he's in there. So we go in there and look. And so this guy, it was an execution by the wife is what happened there. So yeah, you, I think that was the embarrassing uh, moment I was thinking. Yeah. They say, well, he sent that was I mean, he sent his wife. But I thought that was actually, I mean, if you can <laughs> – <laughs> if your wife has that, after I read that story, set, though, I slept. I, thought, okay. I slept with one eye open for a while. I was like, eh, you know, make sure, make sure you got a good situation with your wife. Uh, well, Samson, you mentioned before, Jace. That's an amazing story. Well, I was going to make a comment though when you're talking about the Moses and trusting God. All these these people weren't. I mean, they were having to trust God in seemingly impossible situations, and uh, it reminded me that that illustration that i've heard some preacher give where this guy he got he only went to a hospital for a checkup and uh, i think he was telling it as a true story but i remember remember hearing it but at the same point he applied as the one i want to make and uh you know they the doctor comes in and is like look we're sorry i mean well, you're looking at four or five weeks and he's like four or five weeks like, yeah it's over you know you're gonna die and so the guy, you know, he immediately falls down on his knees and starts praying to God. I mean, it's like he just, you're talking about having a moment of worship here. Yeah. And so then, so the doctor leaves the room, guy's crying, praying, giving his life to God. I mean, calling people just beside himself. Then the doctor comes back and he's like, man, I hate to tell you this. But I actually read you the wrong report. That was <laughs> oh, the no. guy next door. <laughs> 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 so the, the preacher told the story because then the guy's life, oh, it was just a misunderstanding. It was an accident. And he just went right back to his life. But it's like, why are we treating God like that? Yeah. It's like, all of, what are we negotiating based on the circumstance to trust God when all of a sudden it's over? I mean, shouldn't we be doing this every day for real? Yeah. I mean, it. The and he was more saying our relationship with God is not a negotiation. It is something where you're putting your your trust in him no matter what the circumstances. I had a man who day. contacted us the other day, couple, couple, about a week ago, two weeks ago. I called him up, and I've been praying for him. Uh, and he, the doctor said, you got heart troubles, you, you don't have, but three months, whatever, he told him it's that same story. Yeah. I said, let's pray to God and that he'll raise you up and get that behind you. So I called him up and told him what I was doing, he and his wife both. And I said, I just want to let you know I am praying for you. Yeah. So, uh, well, and that's the beautiful thing <clears throat> about the resurrection life is even when you get news like that that's meant for you, you realize that I'm coming back. I mean, that's the beauty of this. Well, that's where I was yeah. going with yeah. this because all the the story I, shifts. I told him. At, I, I read. At, I said you need to read First Thessalonians four thirteen. You know, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men. You have no hope. We believe Jesus died and rose again. So I said, make sure you write this down and live by it. You know, because the time is growing now for you. So. So God may, I'm, we're asking that God to change his mind on you. So, Well, I was trying to make the transition that most of these people were martyred. And, you know, when you get down to where they were sawn into and different things, I mean, and they were confident. They seem confident. I mean, that's why they're in this hall of faith that God was with them. And this was part of the plan. I mean, it's a lot easier to go through that when it's difficult, when you've been walking with him and trusting in him the whole thing. Yep. I mean, the... The resurrection becomes a reality. I mean, if you just push the rewind button back to Enoch where he just took him up. And I mean, these people were so confident in, in where Abraham was sacrificing his son, even though he knew that was the promise that would uh, produce all these generations because they concluded what God's got a plan here. I, I, I got to trust him tomorrow, today. Yep. And yesterday, I mean, this, and so then you start viewing pandemics and death in a different light, which infuriates those who are not believers when they see yep. our attitude. They're like, well, what's wrong with you? You don't seem real worried about this. Right. Mark, I'm like, we're well, because I'm don't not real that. worried about it, you yep. know? I mean, I'll, I'll try to be a good citizen and keep it from spreading, but am I worried about it? Yep. No. Yeah, exactly. I won't mention his last name, but his name is Mark. So Mark just... 
Trust us, we're praying for you, dude. So, <clears throat> let's take our last break. So he mentions David here as well, which is interesting. Obviously, this is King David who, you know, wrote most of the Psalms and, of course, had an amazing life. You know, it's interesting. I, I think I didn't research this, but I think there's 39 kings with with Israel and Judah because they split. And out of the 39 kings, only six of them were good, <laughs> which is a, it's a pretty low percentage. They're not saying much for the human race. No. And then oh, out of Al, all the— if you if you took the politicians and all these uh, governments across the world— kind of make It kind of fits, doesn't it? would be a similar <laughs> yep. percentage. Yeah, I agree. On both sides of every whatever political spectrum you have. Right. You've so met the, a few politicians, haven't you? I have. And there's not many that I would want to hang around with. No. So so the six, out of the six, King David, interestingly enough, was the only one that was actually chosen by God. And he sent Samuel to anoint him when he was just a boy, you know, that this is going to be the guy. Just probably the last person you would pick. Right. He was the run of the just family. Shepherd. Yeah, he was he was the runt. He was the you know he was out keep taking care of the sheep. the The oldest was he looked like Saul, the guy who they had in illegitimately already. And Sam was oh look at this guy. And God says nope. And so he said, you got any more sons? He went through the whole lot and he said nope. You got any more? Well, there's the runt out in the field. Bring him in. That was God's guy. <laughs> so it was really interesting about King David. But you know he also established a covenant with David for the eternal king. And that's why Jesus was called the son of David, because the idea was he told David, he said, from you, the eternal king will come. So you follow that line down. Even with his faults. Even with his faults. Had had an affair, murdered yep. a woman's husband. I mean, it, it, he was quite the guy, but he loved God and God knew his heart. And that's the difference. So that's why you have trust. It. So it is interesting that he threw him in there uh, with the others. But I want to read the rest of this uh, so we can finish it up here and then also talk about it in overtime. And we've, we've referenced this, but I want to actually read the text. All these who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. There's the promises of God, Jays. Who shut the mouths of lions. That was Daniel. Quenched the fury of flames. There's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, they got the short-term promises where they got. Right. It, there was a lot of positive thing, but he's going to get to the end and say, Yet they didn't Ultimately, receive what they was promised. Promise, right. Yeah. <laughs> and escaped the edge of the sword. So those were all the kind of good stories whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection, which he's talking about the final one there. Verse 36, some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, meaning pelted with rocks till they died. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. The, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Talking about the ultimate promise. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So the blood of Jesus went all the way back through time and saved them all, saved, saved the ones who live by faith. Right. Well, to Pretty put wild this story. into an investing, uh, I spoke at a, something on money, one business somewhere, and so I did a little lesson about investing of course, I've, you know, the my final point was when you invest in Jesus, that that's where the true value is, and that's where the long term gains are. Because yeah. here you had short term pain, but it translated into long term gain. Pretty good, Jace. So I got that from uh, when it said, where it says something about value. Jesus was of greater value. Oh, in verse 26, when it says about Moses, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value yeah. than the temporary pleasures of sin. Of course, and all this was temporary. All this being flogged, the short-term pain. Well, the pain was real. I mean, you read this stuff, it's awful. I mean, I don't, I don't even want to 
know what it feels like to be sawn in two, mm. but that's what it says. Yeah. I mean, that's about as bad as it gets. Yeah. And they're, this is written like, oh, that was just part of the plan. This was part of the pr- part of the process. Man. They didn't even receive the promises. So there were some promises that were fulfilled as far as you trust God, and we're going to conquer kingdoms, and justice is going to be a minister. You, know, you think more. you've had a bad day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, they were tortured, and they, all these things happened. So then, I mean, I just interrupted to say, but then that 39, so they were all commended for the faith, because it seems to be a contradiction is what I was bringing up when it says they gain what was promised, I think in the short term of God's will of him, them being used as sacrificial lambs. But then when it gets to 39, they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. I mean, don't you think he's saying the long-term effects of having Jesus as forgiveness and resurrection and the Holy Spirit indwelling you because of that. I mean, yeah, <clears throat> what he's saying is, is to like Sadie's lesson that God has been making promises throughout human history. And so some of those promises were realized by people when, when they went into yeah. Canaan, that was God giving his promise that that would be their land and it became their land. So you had all those but promises. But that was a shadow. That was a shadow of the ultimate promise. Yeah, I was trying to explain that because because yeah. it does seem like well, wait a minute, you know, we're none of this would work if the promise about sending Jesus to this earth wouldn't have happened. N- none of these pr- these promises mm-hmm. empty. But well, when, and when that blood flowed from Jesus. That's what sealed the deal. Because what we've been talking about all along, the whole book of Hebrews. He it, swore by himself. He swore by himself, but it, it, all those promises were just to prepare you for the big promise. Yep. <laughs> Which and, is why the I mean we keep saying this, but keep going back to that Paul's reference in Corinthians where he said, "God's promises are not yes and no. In Jesus, they're always yes." Yep. So when you sit around and and imagine or think up things that you get in Jesus. It's yep, yep, yep. You it, you can sit there for days, for weeks, and months, and years, and try to imagine positive things that are going to happen as a result of Jesus, and you're going to say, "Yep, yeah, okay, yes." And so, even if the negative things that come up, well, what about like all this? That's why I think this is a, it's a deep, but it's a beautiful written explanation on why you're you're blessed despite extreme difficulty happened to you as a result of your faith in God. Because you're like, well, this, this just can't have a happy ending. It does in Christ. Yep. I mean, it. so I think, I think it has everything as, as far as the arguments that the world says. I think it addresses that here because they're like, well, how if God is for you? Because that's usually what they do. Well, how, how do come bad you, things happen? Why are to you good suffering? People? Why is everybody yeah. hollering at you? And because that's going to lead us into chapter twelve. Now, when it says, "Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses," I think most people immediately think to what I don't think this means, which is all these people sitting in a stadium, which is the heavenly stadium, just watching us. No. It, 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 yeah, they're not watching No, that. but I do think what since, they since we that. are running the race, and, and it says, so let us fix it, yep. we're staring at you. I do think there is a Super Bowl that happens every day, and we're we're running that race. But the crowd that's watching us here, most of them are booing. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're not happy. But we're, we're having this bowl-like, and to me it's like if to make this football reference of the stadium because I like that. These are like the people in the Hall of Fame from the yeah. football. They've gone on. We, we know that this yeah. this will work. This Now, that I'm, I'm trying to use a, a physical, earthly thing as football that's not going to apply in every sense, but it's the same principle. You know, they call it the Hall of Fame. Well, this is the Hall of Faith. But our... When we're in the game, yeah, there's going to be more boos than cheers. But the people cheering, they need to be on the field. I mean, that, that, that that's yeah. the point here. As, as we're, 
you know, doing this, and and we have this legacy. But I I do believe that, and the goal is not football; it's Jesus. Because and we, and to to further your point, you, you talk to a Hall of Fame person; they're always talking about how much the game gave them and how much they love younger players and the next generation, and that's the way that the Bible looks at it. People that are believers in God, no matter what era they lived in or what happened to them, they're always talking about the good of God and hoping that future people understand what they understood. So it's the same. Most of these Hall of Famers, too, are not full of pride. No. They're they're decent. They're very humble. And they're humble. Well, that's why it says when we run the race in Chapter 2, you need to get the weights off of you and the sin that so easily entangles them. You're not going to be able to perform if you go out there and, you know, try to carry a football to get back to that reference with like a hundred pound, you know, weight on your back and your feet are all tangled up in some strings. It's interesting, Jason, yeah. when they train, you see them, they do, they are having all that, the cords and the stuff on the running back, you know, but he just does that. So when the game time comes, nothing's going to slow him down. It's but, pretty amazing. And the difference is we go out there and we're not carrying a ball over the goal line. We're just... We're saying Jesus as loud as possible. We're living for it. is the game. Perfect tease, Jay. We're out of time. We'll we'll hit uh, Hebrews 12 uh, on the next podcast. So uh, if you want to follow us over in the overtime, uh, we'll kind of wrap up Hebrews 11 with a couple more thoughts. Uh, That's uh, blazetv.com slash unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.